have different rates of open access. I think mostly that's true for historical reasons, but the historical reasons vary. The arts and humanities have typically had really low rates of open access. And I think that one of the reasons that that's true is a lot of the open access models that have been most popular and common to date have required a fee for publishing open access. Those fees are often paid by grants, but people in the arts and humanities have had relatively small grants that haven't paid for open access fees. And that's one of the reasons why they've had low um, uptakes of, of open access. Chemistry and engineering have also had low rates of open access, but I think that's for different reasons. Um, their journals are really expensive and they have a lot of industry use and there hasn't been an easy, compelling um, story to say why chemistry and engineering have been open access. So there hasn't been much rallying for it and the journals have been reticent because they make so much money on it. So compare that to medicine and biology where the rates of open access are some of the highest. So there you can make a really compelling, and people do indeed make a really compelling um, philosophical case about why those papers should be OA. They've also got large grants for the most part, and they're funded more or less centrally. So one decision by the U.S. Uh, Institute of Health, which is the largest funder of biomed in the U.S. and therefore I think in the world, um, the decision of them to start PubMed Central and make it a requirement that all the things they fund are available OA in there after a year really changed the landscape of uh, the percentage of biomed that was OA. And that in turn makes the publishers need to do business models that support that and find ways to make that lucrative. And open access also gets a good reputation because everybody's doing it, it's required, it's not seen as some lower quality article, it's just seen as a way you can get the paper. Avec une collègue, euh, on a justement étudié la question de, du dépôt euh, par les chercheurs en sciences humaines et sociales dans l'archive ouverte HAL. On s'est amusé, entre guillemets, à analyser tous les dépôts depuis le début de l'archive ouverte, donc de 2002 jusqu'à 2016. Euh, alors, ça serait intéressant de poursuivre l'étude par la suite, parce qu'en fait, 2016, c'est l'année de la loi pour une république numérique. Donc, en fait, la loi qui permet aux chercheurs de déposer une version de leur texte euh, scientifique euh, six mois après la publication en sciences techniques médecine ou douze mois en sciences humaines et sociales. Donc on peut imaginer qu'il puisse y avoir un certain nombre de changements par la suite. Alors on a pu comparer ça aussi avec une étude qu'on avait faite auparavant dans les sciences de la vie, et on s'est rendu compte que pour ce qui était du dépôt du texte intégral par les chercheurs, c'était équivalent aux sciences humaines et sociales et sciences de la vie. C'était assez intéressant. Après, quand on regarde les pratiques en sciences humaines et sociales plus en détail, on se rend compte qu'effectivement, il, il y a de grandes variations disciplinaires. Les disciplines les plus présentes euh, sur HAL, donc selon notre étude, euh, ça va être euh, l'économie, la finance, euh, la sociologie, la géographie euh, et l'histoire. Après, il va y avoir de grandes différences aussi selon le, le type de dépôt. Et en fait, euh, ce qui est intéressant de constater, c'est qu'évidemment, ce que les chercheurs vont déposer euh, majoritairement, ça va correspondre à ce qu'ils enfin, au, au type de publications qui sont majoritaires dans leur pratique. Et donc, euh, certaines disciplines auront tendance à déposer plus d'articles de revue, d'autres, ça va être plus des chapitres d'ouvrages, euh, et d'autres, encore plus des préprints. Donc, par exemple, les articles de revue, c'est plutôt l'économie, chapitre d'ouvrage, ça va être euh, l'histoire, et les préprints, c'est beaucoup l'économie, euh, encore, à nouveau. Euh, sachant que euh, ensuite on va trouver euh, encore d'autres différences, par exemple, sur la présence de texte intégral ou pas, parce qu'il y a des disciplines qui vont déposer énormément de notices sans fichiers associés. Euh, ça, ça va être typique du droit, par exemple, où ils vont déposer énormément de notices d'articles de, de revue, par exemple, mais il n'y aura pas de fichier, et donc on n'aura pas un accès au texte intégral. Euh, par contre, euh, en économie, où on utilise beaucoup de préprints, de working papers, 
les chercheurs vont déposer assez facilement le texte intégral avec la, la référence. Euh, on va trouver aussi dans d'autres domaines, euh, par exemple en sociologie, qui va utiliser pas mal de rapports, euh, ben le texte intégral qui sera associé aussi. Et donc du coup, on se rend compte que euh, dans certaines disciplines, les archives ouvertes sont utilisées pour valoriser des supports qui, ne, qui seraient peut-être plus difficilement accessibles par ailleurs, euh, de la littérature grise. Quoi. Yeah, it's a really exciting time for open access because we're actually just hitting a tipping point from a number of different ways of looking at it. So one way of looking at it is articles that are published right now, about half of them become open access. And that's just been true as of last few years. Right now, if, if an article gets published, about half of those articles will at some point soon become open access. If you look at what people actually read, what they really read, about half of that is also available open access. So even though people like to read old articles and old articles are less likely to be open access, people are more likely to make the papers that are popular and read open access. And that means that right now, what people want to read is about half open as well. Looking ahead, that, that numbers continue to grow, the amount of open access. The reasons it's been growing so far have been the authors be becoming more familiar with it and they're realizing that they want people to read what they're writing and so they're voluntarily making their stuff open access. But even more of a driver than that is that various universities and funders have made it a requirement <laughs> for people to publish open access. And that's really what's powered a lot of the rapid increase over the last five and 10 years and will power it uh, going forward. We think in about five years, about 70% of what people will want to read is open access. Will it ever be 100%? I think, I think we will get to close to 100% open access in the next, I don't know, 10 to 20 years. But I don't think it'll be linear like that. I don't think that extrapolation is actually what can, what's going to happen. It won't be the, sort of the slow and steady climb. It'll do that, I think, for another few years. And then at some point, it'll just seem like the right and easy thing to do for funders to make those requirements. And they'll all start to do it all of a sudden. And it'll be more rapid. And I think that will happen in about 10 years. That's my guess. So I think there'll be a discontinuity where a lot will become open access all of a sudden. Mm -hmm.